I'm pleased to have uh, Minesh Hiran join us. Uh, he is a PhD student in neuroscience at McGill University and the creator of a YouTube channel called The Psychedelic Scientist. Manesh will be giving a talk on the neuroscience of psychedelics and creativity. And he'll be exploring how creativity is typically scientifically defined and studied. He will cover the latest cognitive neuroscience perspectives on how creativity works in the brain, as well as the psychological and neuroscientific research on psychedelics and uh, creativity. So Manesh has been lead or co-author on over a dozen scientific publications and book chapters on topics including psychedelics, meditation, daydreaming, and the default mode network. He's currently conducting research on the brain mechanisms underlying LSD, psilocybin, and DMT in collaboration with Dr. Robert Carhart Harris and others from the Imperial College London Center for, Psych uh, for Psychedelic Research. In his free time, he also runs a YouTube channel called The Psychedelic Scientist, where he discusses the latest findings in psychedelic science in an easy to understand but non superficial form. So with that, I'm really excited to actually have you here at Manesh and thank you so much for joining us. I've actually had a chance to watch some of your YouTube videos too and actually you do a really good job at actually bringing um, these, these topics and uh, going in and exploring the nuance um, while being able to present it in like a digestible manner that's applicable to people who are maybe non-scientists and don't necessarily have the scientific background while still essentially being able to go deep into the topic. So I think that's really, really amazing. You do a really good job at that. And I'm just absolutely thrilled to have you here. So thank you so much for joining us. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be uh, presenting this stuff to you guys today. It's like a lot, it's a very interesting topic. And as you'll see, there's so much we don't know, so much that we need to study. Um, and like research is really in its early stages, but I hope to give you guys a sense of where we're currently at. Um, yeah, so I'll just jump right into it. Let me share my screen. Okay, everyone can see that, right? Looks good. I'm assuming, I'm assuming that's yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, without further ado, I'll just jump straight into it. So first a little overview of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so first I'm gonna cover what is creativity? How is it scientifically defined? Uh, and how is it typically measured? And give an overview of recent research on psychedelics and creativity. Um, and then I introduce this um, particular framework for understanding psychedelics and creativity that I proposed in a paper uh, that came out in early, I think, 2020. Um, and then talking about this last, more recent study that just came out like a month ago, uh, which used this framework as its motivation and kind of studied, um, explicitly studied some of its hypotheses. Uh, so that's like the general overview. And yeah, so what is creativity? How do scientists, scientists define this? Um, so it's defined as the ability or act of producing ideas that are novel, AKA original, unique, or inventive and useful. So which can be appropriate, adaptive, or valuable. Um, and kind of the idea here is if it was just novel, you can have all sorts of crazy ideas that are novel, they're new, um, but they don't really, uh, they're not, they might not make sense. They might not be useful. They might not, might not be, um, yeah, appropriate or, you know, usable in any meaningful way. So therefore typically it's defined with both these two um, components. And of course, how novelty and usefulness is defined is varies widely based on the domain in question. Very different for obviously for painting versus engineering versus music uh, versus science, et cetera. Um, so it's kind of broad in that sense. And, but when it comes down to like ground level in the lab, how do scientists study this? Um, there are two uh, or three main tasks that they use. Um, and these are gonna come up later. So uh, it's good in background information. So the one is the picture concept task. And basically it's very simple. It's like you get a couple of row, a few rows of pictures like this, and then you're supposed to find associations between each row. So, and, and there's usually one correct answer, you know. Uh, so for this one, it would be this hose, sink and bathtub because they're all things that get, um, that water flows out of. And that would be like the correct correct answer of the association. And then you would be, uh, have a timer and, and in three minutes, come up with as many other associations between each row as you can come up with. Um, and that's the task. And then another is the alternate uses task, alternatively called the unusual uses task, where you're given a list of, uh, or an image of a common object, a, a broom, a clothing iron or whatever. And you have to come up with as many creative ideas of how you can use that uh, as possible. Um, so that's the alternative uh, uses task. And then there's another one slightly less uh, common is the pattern line meaning task, which is pretty self-explanatory. You're given a set of lines or patterns, like a kind of drawing 
Uh, that, that isn't really anything in particular and you have to give as many interpretations or meanings to it. Um, and so these are ways of kind of indexing your ability to associate things and come up with creative novel ideas um, in relation to this constrained kind of task. Um, so yeah, so picture concept task, alternate uses task, pattern line meaning task, and these will come up later. Um, and in terms of the responses to these tasks, there's three measures usually employed. So one is originality, which is how original are the ideas or associations you come up with. And how that's measured is, is basically how common are your answers relative to other people in the experiment? Like, did you come up with things that nobody else came up with or did you come up with, with the same things that everyone said? And that's measured um, in a kind of a quantitative way and uh, called originality. And then fluency is just how many associations, how many ideas did you come up with in general? And then ratio is the ratio of originality or fl to fluency. It's like, how, how, what was the quality of the ideas you produced? Um, so the ratio of those two. So those three measures on these three different tasks are usually employed in creativity research. Um, so let's talk about past research on psychedelics and creativity. And, you know, we know from anecdotal reports of people having these creative breakthroughs um, motivated by their psychedelic experiences. There's the most famous example, perhaps, is Carrie Mullis, who discovered the polymerase chain re uh, reaction and attributed and explicitly uh, attributed LSD to it um, and your experience they had um, on LSD. And then there's also Francis Crick, uh, uh, kind of this theory of that he discovered it through uh, seeing, you know, the double helix on his LSD experience, on his LSD trip. But this is pretty controversial and it's being quote unquote debunked by certain people online. It's unclear if that really is the case because he never explicitly said it. Um, but in addition to that is of course, so many artists, Alex Gray and, you know, uh, various others who have been influenced in their um, artistic uh, production or, or creativity through psychedelics. Um, if you look at the early research, early is in mainly the 60s and maybe early 70s, pretty inconclusive. And, and also there's questionable scientific standards during this period. Uh, they didn't really have solid control groups to compare um, people who received the drug. Uh, they didn't use standardized measures. Um, and they did a lot of things that scientists today would just not do um, because it leads to unreliable findings. Um, and even given that certain studies found boost in creativity, some didn't. And it was unclear, you know, what the factors were because there were a lot of compounds and it was just messy research overall. And then you fast forward to the past decade or so, um, and there's a limited number of uh, modern studies. And I'm just going to walk you through the main ones, or perhaps the only ones. There's, there's very little other ones uh, to these, if any. So one was, was using ayahuasca. Um, and basically what they did, they went to uh, two ayahuasca retreats and gave people creativity tasks, uh, in particular, the picture concept task that I just discussed before um, they did ayahuasca and then during their ayahuasca experience. So you have to recognize this wasn't in an experimental context. They went to this retreat and they were doing it in the observational style, which is not as rigorously controlled as, as a typical study. Um, and in this study, they found that uh, ayahuasca actually didn't increase the originality of ideas or the fluency so, or the number of ideas but what it did increase was the ratio, uh, which is you know fluency over uh, or originality over fluency. So basically, the quality of ideas was higher uh, during ayahuasca than before. But importantly, there's no placebo condition, and it's really unclear what you can really infer based based on that. So that was some preliminary evidence for increased divergent thinking, as it's often called, but basically synonymous synonymous with creativity. Um, and there's another one. Uh, where they, again, this was in the context of people doing it in, in a retreat setting, not in the lab. Um, and they found that the day after, um, basically they had people undergoing a psilocybin um, kind of ceremony and they gave them tasks before, one day after and seven days after. And the only time in which they saw increases relative to the baseline um, was one day after psilocybin. And this was particularly uh, the picture concept task and in this time, they had more ideas, more fluency, and more originality. Um, so again, it's like specific subdomains of creativity being improved, and they're actually not consistent across these. But another difference, of course, is one was during the experience, one day was the day after. Um, but at the least, this suggests there might be a time in like the afterglow, after an experience, where you're more creative, or you have more creative ideas. Um, but of course, this is very preliminary evidence for that. 
Um, and there's this other interesting study kind of, this more so relates to associative processing. So basically in this study, they flash people with pictures very, very fast. So it'll be like a tree, a table, a chair, a horse, a car, boom, 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 boom. And you have to say verbally uh, what each image is. And they found that uh, for people, I think uh, this was with LSD, under LSD, um, that they were more likely to make mistakes and say a similar item to what they saw. So if they saw a chair, they might say table. If they, say, if they saw a leg, they might say arm. And, and they would make these errors of um, what they refer to as lexical substitution errors where uh, they would mix a similar concept with the picture that they're seeing. And the idea here is that when you're under a psychedelic, when you see a particular object or a stimu stimulus, um, it activates more associations in your mind of similar objects uh, more strongly. Um, so usually, you know, when you see a chair, it's like obvious that's a chair. But if you see a chair uh, after taking a psychedelic, all of a sudden the associations between, you know, uh, you see chair, like, oh, like dinner, uh, uh, a table, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> things that are similar will also become activated and you can mix them up. Um, so this is kind of another thing that seems to be related to creativity in that you create more associations between things. And then another one is in terms of microdosing. So taking a, a small amount of a psychedelic, a subperceptual dose and seeing if that increases creativity. And so there's two studies, main ones that they found uh, in certain sub aspects of divergent thinking or creativity, uh, there was increased increase force. Um, but again, these weren't in, in lab context. This Anderson paper was in an internet survey of microdosers and this other uh, Pro Prochazkova uh, study was based on going to a microdosing event in the Netherlands and having people do it in this large event. So again, we're really lacking in these rig in rigorous controlled scientific studies. As we'll see later, the first ever one of these in modern times was came out last month and I'll talk about that after a bit more background. But in general, from these, uh, these preliminary studies that are not in a controlled context, there seems to be something going on, but it's not like psychedelics boost creativity unequivocally in all contexts in all ways. It seems to be a bit more nuanced. Um, before I get into this other model of creativity in psychedelics, I'll, I want to um, talk about this idea of primary process thinking, because this is a potential framework to understand how psycho the, to understand the psychedelic experience and why and, or how that might relate to creativity increases. Um, and I know I'm going a bit fast, but there's a lot of stuff I want to cover and we could talk about it after. Uh, and so this idea of primary process thinking is related to psychedelic researcher Robin Carhart Harris's entropic brain theory. And this theory in a very, very simplistic nutshell is that psychedelics make our brain more entropic, uh, AKA unpredictable, complex, um, and uh, I guess chaotic. Uh, and this is what leads to the psychedelic experience and characteristic psychedelic changes to our thinking and our perception and our emotion. Um, and primary processing thinking in particular corresponds to a mode of thinking that's similar to, you could say first onset psychosis um, and uh, perhaps more primitive magical type thinking. It's basically a type of thinking where it's hyper associative. So you, you're seeing meaning and connections between all sorts of things, which you know usually we would not see as interconnected and kind of inferring causal, causality in all these different ways uh, of kind of being unh unhitched from reality and thinking everything's associated with everything else. Um, and also imagistic where everything's a bit more visual and vivid um, in character and also emotionally labile, which means that it's subject to rapid changes in emotions and it's also kind of internally inconsistent, illogical, discontinuous thoughts jump from thing to thing without much sense behind it. And again, it's not constrained by reality. So it's just like kind of magical mode of thinking where everything's associated and uh, it's very unstable and illogical. And so psychedelics um, seem to be able to induce this kind of thinking and this is supported by research uh, using measures of primary process thinking, basically looking at uh, like what is the, what are the, um, properties of language of people in a primary process state and then using measures of that while people are under psychedelics and having them speak about their experience and seeing how much they actually use this language. There's actually a large number of studies supporting increased primary process uh, language in under the psychedelic experience going back to the 70s. 
and also another recent study, because this whole mode of thinking you might have noticed is very similar to dreams, uh, and it's very dreamlike. And there have been studies specifically showing that the phenomenology or the subjective nature of dreams is very similar to psychedelic experience as well. And so this gives us a model to understand how psychedelics seem to be able to put us in this unconstrained, hyper-associative uh, mental state that's not constrained by reason as it usually is, and that this might allow us to make all these new associations and have novel creative ideas. So that's the kind of general idea I'm proposing here. Um, and then moving on into a more nuanced characterization of creativity, um, we have to recognize that, uh, somebody said something in the chat, okay. Uh, that creativity is not this, it's not like, you know, we're in, we're being like creativity happens and it doesn't happen. It's like creativity is this nuanced dynamic phenomena of moving between different types of thinking. One way to conceptualize this, um, well, yeah, as I said, it's not a singular mental state. It's a, it involves dynamically moving between different mental states or different modes of thought. And now we're getting into cognitive neuroscience research where they've shown that in the brain and also psychologically, the act of creating ideas and the act of evaluating ideas are very distinct states in the creative process. And that uh, usually when we're coming to a creative solution to something, we're iterating, we're creating ideas and then evaluating, kind of refining and creating and then iterating, you know, refining, and then maybe went down a dead end path and you came back and then you did it again. And that's the process, the dad, uh, that's the dynamic process of creativity. And uh, importantly, it's generation versus evaluation and the iteration between these. Um, so yes, that's what I wanted to say here. And so if you think of uh, creativity as this dynamic phenomenon where we alternate between two different, mainly two different primary aspects of thinking, um, then we can maybe situate creativity in relation to other types of thought. And so this brings in the paper I wrote with Robin Carhart Harris uh, in London and also some researchers at UBC uh, that I worked with in an undergrad a few years back. And this, as I said, situates creativity in the context of other types of thought. And so a lot to go into here. So basically, let's go through this little plot here. Um, so there are two dimensions here. Uh, so you can say, depending on the type of thinking that you're having right now, you can characterize it in two different dimensions. One is what we can call automatic constraints. So this is basically how much is your thought automatically constrained to go to something. And this is usually associated with emotion. So you can say, uh, see here, when automatic constraints are strong, that is what's characterized rumination and obsessive thought. It's like your emotion is pulling you to a particular type of thought. Um, so you incessantly just thinking about, you know, some negative, uh, aspect of your life or whatever it is, and you can't get out of it. And that mean, that kind of corresponds to your thought being automatically constrained. Um, and then deliberate constraints on this like x-axis down here corresponds to when we're trying to fo be focused and solve a specific task versus when we're dreaming and kind of, or on psychedelics and our mind is kind of free flowing. And so the type of thought that we have at a given moment in time is based on the balance between how much we're consciously using our attention to control it and how much our emotion is automatically guiding it. And uh, in the context of this model, um, first let's talk about creativity. Um, so when you're creating or generating creative, creative ideas, you have less automatic and deliberate constraints because you wanna allow your mind to roam freely uh, without making it overly constrained and not getting pulled by your emotions into particular lines of thought. Um, Whereas when you want to evaluate your, your creative ideas and see if they're actually good and useful, then you want to move into this goal directed area where you're kind of focused and you're like, okay, does this fit the particular criteria I have um, regarding whether it's good or not? And so the idea in relation to this whole thing is that psychedelics fall in this place of unconstrained thinking where there's not much automatic constraints and not much liberal constraints um, or that is dynamically moving between these. Um, in a manner similar to dreaming. And so again, this is a way of formally describing how psychedelics are a relatively unconstrained, um, induce a relatively unconstrained mental state or style of thinking. Uh, people in the chat asking stuff. Yeah, I can share these slides, that's fine. After It is a lot of information, but happy to share. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so, so that's the model in a nutshell. I can come back to it. Uh, actually, I will come back hey, to hey, it. Hey, just so you know, you, you don't have to worry about the chat. We're, um, I'm grabbing those for later if there are co yeah, specific yeah. questions for you. So you don't, you don't have to stop, but you certainly can if you want. <laughs> for sure. I just you. wanted to check if somebody's saying, oh, you're going way too fast. Like, I don't know what you're talking uh, about. That's what I was I'll, let, I'll let you know. Okay, sounds good. Um, so brain predictions. Uh, let's talk about this in brief. There's a lot to go into here and we can come back to it again. So, um, so we're going to focus on what's here labeled as a DN, which is the default network, which is basically the default mode network is another name for it. We're going to talk about the DN, the FPCN, which is the front or parallel control network and the salience network. And um, so here the default mode network is being decomposed into three different subsystems because some researchers are saying the default mode network is not just one network, it's three or maybe two. Um, and it's more complex than that. Um, and so we can understand if we look here, um, the default mode network has these purple arrows coming out of it, the DNMTL, uh, which is the part of the default mode network that has the hippocampus, which is a memory area. So you could say this part of the default mode network that has one of the most important memory areas in the brain uh, is the source of thought content or variability in thought. So basically our thoughts are gen, the thought, the, the theory or the idea is that thoughts are generated from this aspect of the deep mode network. And then the frontal parietal control network, which most importantly has areas in our prefrontal cortex is involved in deliberate constraints. So you can see this red arrow coming down uh, and then affecting the DNMTL in this kind of way. Um, and so when we're kind of deliberately constraining and focusing our thoughts on a particular thing, then the FPC and the um, you could think of it as a prefrontal cortex simplistically um, is modulating the default mode network and constraining the types of thoughts it's generating. And then the salience network, which kind of does a number of things, but as the name suggests, it tags things as salient, as in it says whether things are important or not in an automatic unconscious way. Um, you can see how this also constrains the default mode network and gets the DNMTL. And so this corresponds to automatic constraints. So the salience network constrains the default mode network's thought variability or thought content based on emotion or what's programmed, what's programmed um, to think of as important, whereas the FPCN represents us consciously and deliberately controlling our thoughts. And so we can say simplistically that um, kind of different types of thinking are based on a kind of different balance between the FPCN salience network and uh, default mode network. And what else do I want to say here? Mm, and yeah, again, so when you're creating, uh, generating creative ideas, the default mode network is less constrained by both the FPCN and the salience network. And when you want to evaluate them, you're mainly getting the FPCN kind of, because you're then you're deliberately thinking about it and trying to evaluate. Um, so that's the idea here. And then evidence for this. So um, in one study, they found that when people were creating um, uh, are actually pieces of art, like creative pieces of art. When they were right, creating it, generating it, there was greater default mode network involvement. And when they were evaluating, there was greater FPCN and salience network, just as we predict. And there's two studies suggesting that. Um, and then another interesting study had people generate creative ideas, but for a very specific defined thing. And they found that there was default mode network activity, but also FPCN. Because now you get this interesting thing where you're generating, but there's more constraint on the generation process. So now this FECN is playing more role during that period. Again, suggesting more nuance in these different stages and interactions between these networks. Um, yeah, so that's what I see there. And so again, to come back to this, so we understanding the psychedelics, um, because they disrupt brain networks such as the default mode network and front and parallel control network and the salience network, um, they're inducing this relatively unconstrained and hyper associative uh, mode of cognition that's conducive to creative generation. Because now the automatic constraints mediated by the salience network are less strong uh, majority of the time. And then the deliberate focused ones are also disrupted. And then also the default mode network kind of becomes a bit more and tropic or, or crazy in its activity. So there's more thought variability at the same time. So this is kind of giving a more neuroscientific basis for this idea that psychedelics operate in this unconstrained area. Um, and I do want to say that this is a model and it's a simplification. 
because of course the psychedelic experience is so variable and there's so many types of states you could go into when if you, you know for example if you're having a bad trip you could become very automatically constrained and sucked into this negative pit of anxiety and fear uh, which can certainly happen if you use them irresponsibly um, so there is kind of nuance to this but this is again just a model for talking about them in general um, and yeah, and under psychedelics, yeah, this is kind of what I said, like the auto automatic constraints can vary, but sometimes they can be increased in a very specific way that allows us to pursue some line of thought we usually would have ignored because it didn't seem to, like, realistic or worthy to explore. So in this way, it can kind of expand our search space and allow us to go into novel areas where which we wouldn't have gone before because it changes how our emotions or our idea of what's meaningful or important um, is altered. And, um, and of course, you know, just because psychedelics create all sorts of novel ideas uh, doesn't mean um, they're necessarily actually novel and useful. Um, you're just creating a whole bunch of bizarre things. Uh, some might just be nonsense afterwards, um, but some might be very useful. That's why it's important to engage in this more deliberately constrained mode of thinking after the experience to then be like, okay, I had these 20 ideas. I got them down somehow. I recorded them. Uh, and now like how much of them make sense and how much of them actually are useful for what I want out of them. Um, and yeah, and so next let's move into a study that actually deliberately took this model I proposed in the paper I wrote and actually studied it, which was like awesome. Somebody actually did this, they actually really used what I wrote. Uh, I didn't go to nothing. And uh, this is done at Maastricht University in the Netherlands by a researcher named Natasha Mason. Um, and okay, so they had 60 subjects in the study, 30 uh, took psilocybin and 30 placebo, and it was a randomized double blind uh, placebo controlled trial, kind of like gold standard in research. And this 0.17 milligram slash kilogram equates, because most people are around 70, 60 to 70 kilograms, so it's something like 12 to 13 uh, milligrams per person which if we give a broad understanding of how much uh, dried mushrooms, maybe two, two and a half uh, range. Uh, so it's a decent dose, but not, it's not like five grams in silent dark darkness type thing, but uh, it's definitely you'll experience, uh, you'll have a psychedelic experience to some degree uh, at that dosage. And um, to remind us of those tasks before, the picture concept task and the alternate uses task, hope you guys remember, but they administered this before uh, during the experience and seven days later. And what did they find? So very interesting. Uh, this is, this is going to open up a big can of worms here. So the picture concept task, they actually only saw decreases acutely. So they created less ideas um, and less original ideas under psilocybin relative to placebo. Not what we'd uh, expect and not what a lot of psych psychonauts might hope, but that was the finding there. And we could talk about that in a bit. Also on the alternate uses, um, there was either no change or decreased number of ideas in psilocybin. So again, it seemed like psilocybin was disrupting uh, performance on these specific creative tasks. Um, but what's interesting with the alternate uses tasks, when they did this task again seven days later, they had more originality than placebo at that time point, suggesting again, similar to this other research I showed, uh, I talked about that in the period after taking a psychedelic, there might be persisting changes in the kind of afterglow that you might experience um, that lend itself to, you know, a more flexible state of mind where you're a bit more creative. Um, so that, that seemed, that might be a thing. So uh, when it's measured, um, it seems to be an important variable in this context. Something interesting here too, is that in addition to these tasks where you have to understand, it's kind of an interesting thing to take, you know, two and a half grams worth of psilocybin um, and then sit at a computer and do this contrived tasks of, Oh, like make associations between these pictures. That's kind of like, you know, it's an interesting thing to try to do while you're under mushrooms. Um, so something they also did was had them measure just in general throughout the entire, you know, four to six hour experience. How much did you personally subjectively feel that you had um, insightful and original ideas? And they found significant increases after psilocybin, which is what you might expect. Um, and actually, interestingly, this correlated with disintegration of the default mode network and also correlated with this increase in originality at seven days later. Um, so there seems to be something going on in a subjective sense of creativity, which had an effect on the objectively, you know, objectively in terms of the task created creativity a week later. Um, and what's interesting, these changes acutely didn't correlate um, with default mode network changes. 
uh, in the same way that this did. There actually were some correlations, but that's a bit more detailed to get into at this point in time. Um, so overall, it seemed like there was a discrepancy where in the tasks that they were given, they actually were less creative during the psilocybin experience, um, but they felt that they had more insights and more original ideas outside the context of that task during their experience. Um, and that also there seemed to be a change seven days later. Um, so this suggests just like how nuanced and complex, you know, the effects of psychedelics are in creativity. Um, you know, some people may have expected like, yeah, like, you know, you take it and unequivocally in all aspects, yeah, you're more creative, you have all these great ideas, you have new insights, um, but it seems to be a bit more nuanced than that. And having a context that's placebo controlled and rigorous is a way of kind of going deeper uh, than just anecdotal reports or thinking that you're more creative, um, et cetera. But again, um, there are also limitations with using these contrived laboratory tasks um, to try to index the psychedelic experience too. Um, yeah, and as, this is my last slide. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of the, the kind of concerns in this area. So one is objective versus subjective creativity. So objective creativity is like, you do a task, what is your score on that task? You know, did you come up with original ideas? Did you come up with a lot of ideas? Was there a good ratio? Um, that's objective. And then subjective is like, yeah, I felt like I had new insights into my life, into my problems. I had more original ideas uh, of just this self-report measure of self-assessed creativity. And actually in the early research in the 60s and 70s, um, as well as in this study, there's a disparity between the two, you know, where if you get them to do these tasks, uh, there seems to be, you know, sometimes there's increases, sometimes there's not, sometimes there's decreases that we saw here, um, where subjectively they always think that they were more creative uh, and insightful during the experience. So it's like a cynical person uh, would say like, yeah, it's just some delusion. They just think they're creative, but they're just, you know, tripping and they're uh, over interpreting things. Um, but I think it's more nuanced than that, where, you know, there are valid and useful and meaningful insights and creative ideas that somebody can have. Um, but they probably occur in the context of a lot of stuff that's not, um, you know, the, truly creative or novel as a person sober would evaluate. Um, and also the problem here I alluded to earlier is that in these tasks, you know, on a, for anybody here who's done a couple of grams of mushrooms to then come out of your experience and then sit at a computer and do this little task of uh, focusing and finding associations, maybe in pictures, you know, it's hard, you know, and we know from other research that psychedelics disrupt our sustained attention and makes us more susceptible to distractions, like big surprise, right? And, and so like, it makes sense that in these contrived laboratory settings, uh, it's hard for people to perform the task. And it might not necessarily because be because it's disrupting our creativity, it's disrupting our ability to perform a contrived task by, you know, interacting with our attention. But then we get into questions of can attention can be can that can we separate that from creativity or all these things intertwined, you know, uh, are these just like, um, you know, scientific distinctions we introduce which don't exist in reality, uh, and how much, you know, use do they have, we can go down the kind of philosophical rabbit hole with that as well. But, uh, but in general, I think studies need to differentiate between um, whether, you know, between this idea of subjective versus objective creativity, and somehow uh, assess that in more detail. Uh, and then similar related to this is spontaneous versus deliberate. So again, deliberate is when you're given a specific creativity task and asked to solve it. Um, and this type of creativity might be conducive to engineering, for example, where it's like, you know, design this very creative, uh, I don't know, uh, create a good creative design for this bridge or, or machine or whatever it is that engineers do, right? It's a very specific thing you're trying to solve. Where spontaneous you know, you're an artist and you just want the free flow of ideas to come to you and, you know, activate the muse and, and all this kind of stuff. And that uh, is a very different mode of creative thinking than solving an engineering task or architecture task, right? And, um, and so again, psychedelics might improve spontaneous creativity. That is when we're in the absence of an overt problem to solve, uh, they give us insights perhaps into our personal life or into a problem we had been thinking about for a long time. Uh, which we weren't consciously trying to solve in that moment, um, which is often how great ideas come. People talk about it coming in a dream or on a walk, et cetera. That's very spontaneous. Whereas these deliberate uh, tasks uh, might be deliberate, hard to do under a psychedelic because again, the disruptions in our attention, et cetera. So this is another important distinction. And then also personal versus non-personal, right? So it's like, 
you might have insights and creative ideas and, um, and make connections between things. And these might be predominantly personal and also spontaneous that we understand like, oh, this is why I've been behaving this way. Like, oh, like this relationship issue is the same as my last five relationships. <laughs> and, and like seeing these patterns in yourself and having insight into these very personal things uh, is very different than, you know, having an insight into like, oh, this is another way I can use a broom <laughs> or, or whatever it is in these tasks, right? So it's very different uh, mode of creative thinking again. And psychedelics might perhaps be more effective for the personal side than non-personal. It's another distinction that's not addressed really yet. And uh, this kind of all suggests the idea that we need creativity tasks specifically designed for psychedelics that get at these three different dimensions here. Um, Cause we, there's limitations in just like pulling these creative thought uh, tasks used in sober people in a standardized way and applying it to this radically different mental state and expecting it to translate seamlessly, which it won't. Um, so I think uh, something I personally wanna to do too is in the future in my research is find novel task paradigms or adapt, adapt existing tasks to make them more amenable to psychedelics and to answer these more nuanced questions related to these different dimensions I've outlined. Uh, saying that's very important to really understand psychedelics and not just like, you know, fit the circle, which is psychedelics into the square hole of existing scientific methods, right? Uh, it's like you need some adaptation there. And yeah, so much more research is needed, totally in, in its infancy. In the next five years, we'll see a lot as funding uh, pours in and ethical uh, regu and like regulations and hurdles around there are kind of uh, eased. Um, so lots of exciting stuff uh, to come. And with that, you know, check out my YouTube channel. I talk about the latest scientific research uh, in a way that's layperson friendly, but not like super sensationalistic and superficial, like a lot of media treatments. Um, so search me, it's the Psychedelic Scientist on YouTube and Instagram, active on both of those things, um, especially Instagram, perhaps uh, more content on there. And yeah, here are my references. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Happy to answer anything. Excellent, excellent, awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was asked earlier around sharing slides. Uh, we'll find a way to do that in the days after and we'll probably send a message out on, on Meetup. Mm -hmm. um, you can, uh, if you don't, uh, actually you can keep those up just in case you wanna go back for any questions. We haven't gotten any questions yet, but as, as mentioned, um, oh, there we go. Well, there we have the first one, Nikki. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, and you can turn on video if you want or not, um, and go right ahead. Okay. Um, hey. Can Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Clear. Perfect. Great. Um, thank you, Manesh, so much for this great talk. Um, question. So I don't know if you're familiar with um, Quali Research Institute's concept of neural annealing. So basically excitation kind of builds up to a certain point, um, then it crosses a threshold and you have a self, uh, these new patterns kind of self-organize and then mm -hmm. um, the neural activity sort of cools or returns back to normal, but some of these um, sort of self-organized patterns remain. Mm -hmm. Does that have to do, would you say, with that um, finding that seven days later, you know, they had more creativity? Do you think that those two concepts relate? Yeah, totally. No, it's a good point. And actually, I mentioned simulated annealing in the paper. There's like a, a sec little oh, section cool. on it. So uh, totally. Uh, I think one way of understanding psychedelics is like kind of, um, you know, put you in the state where uh, things are more fluid, more flexible, right? And it's like you're making the metal more liquid so it can be defined in a more way and it can, it can uh, enter into shapes that it wasn't able to before, I guess. So it allows this potential for new grooves and things to set in. Um, and I think, yeah, in the afterglow period, you're in this afterglow of slowly becoming more rigid in your mode of thinking again. Um, and so there's a sustained more flexibility where you can have more ideas. So I did, definitely, I think the simulated the kneeling idea is very apt for describing that and that kind of sustained and kind of progressively weakening perhaps change afterwards. So totally. Awesome. Thanks mm -hmm. for helping me integrate those ideas. <laughs> for sure, my pleasure. All right, excellent. Uh, next up, uh, Alan, we had another, sorry, I had a um, question from Alan um, who asked, uh, oh, Sorry, how might one modify these tests 
to make them more amenable to psychedelics? Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting question, right? Because I think for one, I think intermixing uh, things that are more personal with these kind of contrived, like connect, you know, uh, these different household objects together um, and somehow making it more personal would be an interesting way to see um, whether we can prime people to have personal insights um, in addition to priming them to make new connections between objects we're showing them. Um, how, how we do that exactly? I have, to, I have to think about it. Like I'm not entirely sure, but I think adapting these tasks to tap into the dimensions that I mentioned were personal versus non-personal um, and then objective versus subjective. Um, somehow finding a way to, in the same task, measure somebody's performance on, on a specific task and in a related way, their ability to spontaneously come up with creative ideas. So I think something around priming people with different images from their past or, or different pictures and seeing how that affects ideas um, and also relating that to also, you know, a particular task with things that are not related to them. So something like this. So something of taking those dimensions and incorporating them into existing tasks. Uh, I think would be needed or just coming up with a whole new paradigm and approach, uh, which require a lot of thinking and iterating through different designs to get. Um, it's a creative, creative process of its own to come up with that task, but uh, definitely something like this. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, okay, next up is Emily and Christoph. Uh, so Emily, go right ahead. You should be able to unmute. Emily out there. Hi. Oh, hey. um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Put a video on too. That's not super weird. This voice coming at you from the abyss. Um, thank you so much. That was super cool. Um, I really appreciate too how you're so focused on the fact that science can be a bit rigid when it comes to kind of expanding and bringing in these some of the things that we were so not allowed to have for so long in the labs. And that's awesome. Um, I just kind of more of an opinion question. I'm curious how much the history of um, these patients would come into effect something like this. And I ask that because I've never um, been a very like creative kind of open-minded person. It's something that's coming into later in life, but I'm more so curious depending on their history, like if they've tried psychedelics before or maybe being raised in more of like um, a stricter household. Like I'm just kind of curious, is creativity really something that everyone has? Or is it something that these individuals might already have kind of in their mind already to be able to do, if that makes sense? Yeah, totally. No, it's a good question. And um, I personally think anybody can be creative. They just have to get yeah. out of their own way. Um, but I think in these studies, a lot of times, um, they're either comparing the same people with and without psychedelics, right? So it's like, yeah. within that person, are they improving? I think that's mm -hmm. the, the best way to look at it. Um, and also there are, yeah, I don't think they did in this study, but you can easily give them a self-report measure. It's like, how creative are you in your everyday life? And yeah, maybe it's the case that people who are already creative get more benefits, whereas people who don't identify as a creative person uh, maybe get less benefit from it, or maybe it's the other way around, right? We yeah. Really don't know. So there could be something there, but we don't know. Yeah, yeah just because like what you're saying about getting out of your own way, I think that's like a skill. So it'd be interesting if people who hadn't developed that prior, because I agree, I do think that we all have ability to be creative, but it'd be very mm -hmm. interesting to see if these people were creative in their daily life in general, or if this was like, and also too, to have kind of the confidence to express a new idea takes a lot as well, right? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. These are, yeah, 100%. These are important things to, to study, right? I can even, I know Natasha who did the study, I can ask her even if they had some measures of that or something, but I think mm -hmm. that's really interesting for sure. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, okay, thanks, Emily. Uh, gonna want your hand there, and uh, Christoph, you are up next, and then uh, Alessandra will be after. Uh, awesome, thanks, thanks so much. Uh, and then, yeah, thanks for the presentation, that's really amazing. Uh, I just had a question sort of regarding a little bit of the history of uh, sort of gearing, especially like psychedelics and creativity. I mean, I see this sort of like a lot of the science and stuff coming out. Like, is this, is there more of a history that kind of goes back into this? I know they were doing studies and stuff back in the fifties and stuff, but do they, like, is this a relatively young science in this sense? And like, um, 
where do you, I guess the question too is like, where do you see, or like what are some of the big questions you see being answered maybe even in like the next five years uh, with regard to some of this science, right? Because I mean, it is advancing pretty fast and there's so many questions that we're already able to mm -hmm. answer that maybe some people even never thought was possible. I just wonder what your sort of perspective on, on that would be. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, totally. I think a lot of it will be, uh, there'll be interesting things seeing like the mechanisms of how psychedelics work in therapy, how they work in the experience, how that can perhaps be optimized or used in different ways. A lot of interesting research looking at kind of dive more, diving more into set and setting and the context, how can that be manipulated in the ideal way uh, to um, kind of facilitate a particular experience. And also like how do psychedelics create these lasting like improvements in well-being that we're seeing or reductions in depressive symptoms um, there's stuff around cognitive flexibility and psychological flexibility. Um, there's the mystical experience aspect, but, you know, but then the question is, why does having a mystical experience help people? What, what is actually going on there on the ground level? You know, how does it, how do, you know, retrieving memories fit into this whole thing and, you know, working through unconscious material. Uh, this is all stuff I think will be studied more and more in the coming years as we understand. It's like, yes, maybe psychedelics do work in terms of therapy, but like how and why and how can we use that knowledge uh, to inform other areas. Um, so I think uh, that more research will be going on that. And of course, creativity is, uh, goes hand in hand with all that because the ability to create creative solutions to your own personal problems and uh, see beyond your kind of tunnel vision in order to behave and, you know, uh, and heal yourself, behave in new ways is also central to it. So um, something I wanna do is contribute to that research and I, that I will do, I plan to do. And I think a lot of other researchers are also going down that path, so. I think there'll be a lot of that in the next, you know, three to five years and beyond. Awesome. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Fun. Thanks. Uh, next up, uh, Sandra. Hope I'm getting that name right. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute. Oh, you already did. Go right ahead. Yes, thank you. Yes, Alessandra. Um, thank you. I came in a little bit late, so forgive me if this question has been um, asked already, but um, I'm really interested in sort of in, I'm a, th I'm a psychotherapist and I work with a lot of artists and in terms of um, creativity when it comes to the individual and their relational creativity, right? And then how do we how do we bring that into the collective experience, either professionally or um, you know it contextually to sort of help the world? I'm just curious to know if it'd be helpful or if you think it'd be helpful to sort of assess roadblocks to creativity prior to having um, an altered. Uh, um, experience because I'm just curious to know if you think that you know once we assess specifically the roadblocks and then come in and have a psychedelic experience if the if the post assessment might be a little bit more um, specific to those issues and if people can say things like yes that part of my um, difficulty when it comes to creativity has been improved and if so how um, it, in yeah I'm just it, thinking about my work with artists specifically, but even beyond when it comes to, you know, people creating innovative technologies for the environment and things like that. So just wondering yeah. what your thoughts on that. No, I think that's a great idea, right? Cause it's slightly different from what happened in the study I described where you're just taking these people and it's like without any understanding of their creative background, basically it's like, are, is this improving uh, in this experience or a week later? But I think if the goal is to see like, can it, help people become to overcome creative roadblocks in the long term and just become more creative in general for the rest of their life perhaps it's a very different question but it's a really important one right and so i think it would be a great idea to like maybe send out some kind of screening survey to people it's like what are your main creative uh, roadblocks and then kind of maybe analyze that and get like the four major roadblocks then have a study with like 10 people in each one and then see how it affects different roadblocks I think that would be a very cool study to run. And yeah, definitely, maybe I can help facilitate having that happen at some point in the future. I think that's a great idea. Beautiful, yeah, I, I'd i love to see that happen. Um, yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you so much. Totally. This was awesome. Awesome, my pleasure, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for your question. Uh, last call, oh yeah, I'm squeezing right in there, Ramsey. Uh, go right ahead, you can rant, Ramsey. You can uh, I'll, I'll unmute your... Um, I, mean, I was just thinking about it in terms of future research. So I've just had uh, three psilocybin experiences. 
And I know uh, certain areas that I never uh, paid attention to before would come up. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. You know, so how, how long will this last? How long, you know, uh, will I forget about this in a week, a few weeks, so forth? And I was just wondering about the long-term effects on our uh, on cognitive aspects in certain areas. So let's say uh, all of a sudden I become detail-oriented, you know, as a result of my trips, and I uh, and I start to be a perfectionist, and then so a study could be taken to see, okay, so what are the new qualities that a person gets from the experiences, the psychedelic experiences? How long do they last? Do they strengthen? You know, so the uh, the strength and duration of new experiences that these people have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's super important. It's, it's a good question because in addition to the things you're saying, I was saying like, you know, uh, detail oriented and other things, but also just how much are you in healthier modes, ways of thinking and how much, almost the same question is like, do your depression symptoms, how long do they last if they get improved? Um, it's slightly different, but similar. And I think it comes down to, I mean, yes, it is an important thing to study, but it's hard because once they leave the study, uh, people vary widely in how much they're trying to integrate it. So I think integration is essential, right? Like, are you consciously taking this thing that you learned or you tapped into and trying to implement it in your day to day through deliberate effort? Um, that makes a difference, whole difference in the world, because if you don't do that, things will fade away and they might fade away within a week, could be a month, depending on the person, depending on the context they leave, whether it's conducive to that behavior or not. Uh, there's so many variables that contribute to it. But I think it is an important question that studies are starting to address more is how to conceptualize the sustained effects and the role of integration, uh, et cetera. Um, because, yeah, because psychedelics can make you into a different mental state and change you for that day. But then whether you go back to how you were before or not really depends on your effort. And, you know, and the way that humans are wired, it's hard to make new habits. It's hard to transform yourself in a lasting way without conscious, deliberate and consistent effort, right? So I think, yeah, it's a good question, but there's a lot of stuff to go into that on how to study it without all sorts of confounds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For sure. Uh, <clears throat> sorry about that, just took a second there. Thank you, Ramsey. Uh, okay, we got actually a couple more uh, uh, squeezing in. We had, well, Maria had raised her hand, but now it's gone, so... Uh, Maria, did you want to ask a question? If not, um, if you do, you can. No, in. I'm okay. Actually, that was an, <laughs> an accident. Sorry about uh, that. No worries. No worries. All right, Ryan, you're up next. You're muted, Ryan. Um, okay. There we go. Hi. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering if um, you could touch a little bit. I, I, I think you might have went over it before, but about like dosage and, um, you know, on and like how long, you know, recommended to stay on and off if it's a microdose or if it's like a, tri uh, a sort of a trip with like a gram or more, anything like that. For sure. I mean, I think if you're going to do it, it really depends on what your goals are. Um, if, if it's creativity, if we stick with the theme of creativity, uh, I think, um, yeah, I guess I, we don't really know. Cause like, you know, it could be that the day after your microdose, you're a bit more creative in some kind of afterglow uh, as opposed to the day of. And there is research suggesting that on the day of too, you get boosts in certain types of creativity. Uh, although it's unclear how much of that is placebo, um, which is also a question that needs to be answered by the research. Um, and I think, it really depends. I think in terms of taking a larger dose, I think perhaps if you want to have insight into your own life and kind of see beyond your usual identity and your narratives you have about yourself, maybe a larger dose. But if you want to like solve a task that you have, then a smaller dose might make more sense because uh, it disrupts your ability to, uh, it disrupts your attention less if you take less, right? So I think uh, whether you microdose, take a medium dose or a macro dose, you know, it depends on uh, how you want to apply that state in that moment. Um, taking into account how higher doses will disconnect you from trying to do something externally a lot of the times, right? Um, so it depends on a lot of things. And what about the frequency, like uh, in terms of the dosages? I think microdosing, uh, I think the standard that people do is, I mean, as it's the Fadiman thing is like Monday, Thursday, or like a couple of days apart, a couple of days a week, um, doing uh, with mushrooms like 100 milligrams or something, depending on the strain. 
Um, and, uh, or like, uh, like Stamets has to do it five days on two days off, something like this. Um, but he also stacks with other stuff for neuroplasticity. Um, honestly, I really like, there's no firm suggestion I can give. It's just based on what works for, on you and experimentation. Uh, there's no research on that really. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Totally. Thank you, Ryan. Moving on to, uh, Lena and then Anna. Lena, you can go ahead and unmute. Hello, hi Manish. Thank you for uh, opening a door to us to look into the scientific community. Yeah, and it's it's really good seeing you like in your element too. It's cool. really awesome to hear. Thanks. Um, I was also kind of uh, getting a brainwave, um, thinking about how people notice that maybe they're more creative, especially after um, psychedelic experiences. And I don't remember if I read this or this was just my own opinion. Um, is there is there people thinking about like how psychedelics um, impact neuroticism and perhaps if it's the reduction in neuroticism that helps um, mm. open people up to be more creative? Right. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think there has been research showing significant reductions in neuroticism uh, after okay. psychedelic use. Uh, there is increases in openness, which sometimes can be counter or negatively correlated with neuro neuroticism. There's something related going on, but actually the research does suggest people who are high on neuroticism are more likely to have a challenging experience, uh, which mm -hmm. might, might not be that surprising, but that has been kind of quantitatively shown. Um, but yeah, the, the connection between neuroticism and creativity is an interesting one, um, but it hasn't been looked at. I know data sets exist where that can be looked at, but I haven't seen it explicitly looked at. So okay, yeah, cool. I don't really know. Yeah. Thanks. But totally, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Anna B, you are up next. Hello, hello. Thank you, Manish, for your presentation. I really enjoyed the model you presented. Very insightful. Um, I was just curious, you mentioned at the beginning uh, different psychedelics uh, such as psilocybin, LSD, DMT, and I was wondering, I know there is limited, limited data, uh, but it, could there be a difference between creative insights or outputs on different type of psychedelics, such as I'm, and I'm thinking more DMT as opposed to LSD and psilocybin. I know the two kind of act similarly on the brain as opposed to DMT. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I, I do in my head like uh, box or categorize LSD and psilocybin and DMT in slightly different categories, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. a, lot of, a lot of the time DMT is uh, less personal in a sense. It's kind of you're blasted off to this some crazy experience and then you come back down in 10 minutes. Not um, if you not, microdose with it. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, in terms of the standard way of taking it, I feel like a lot of times you're not, you know, going through your past memories and processing stuff from your life. You're kind of going out of this life into some other experience. Uh, um, and so I think that the insights you get there will probably be different as in they're less personal and more like... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what kind of insights you get on DMT. It's like questioning your reality or something more extreme metaphysical. Um, but yeah, like I'm, there is actually ongoing research. I know a guy, um, Chris Timmerman at Imperial College London, who's actually doing the first ever brain imaging study on DMT. Um, so me, I know Chris well, and he's also doing studies on how psychedelics change people's metaphysical beliefs. And oh. I think, and I do think that DMT is perhaps more likely to change people's meta metaphysical beliefs uh, you know, than LSD or psilocybin, unless you take a crazy dose, which is dangerous territory. But uh, it, yeah, so there's work being done on it. And I think there would be some differences there. Yeah. I might just reach out to you to talk more about this. I'm very interested. Yeah, I think if you email them, yeah, he, he would be, it's the topic he's really interested in too. Thank you. Thank you so much. For sure. Well, cool. Paul, you are up next. You can unmute and have a go. All right, here, Manesh. Uh... Thank you very much for your presentation channel. Um, quick question on creativity and brain waves, which hasn't gone over, I haven't, we haven't gone over that yet. So are theta waves or alpha or gamma or anything like that, what is your uh, thoughts on creativity from that? Yeah, I would say um, perhaps reductions in alpha might be most relevant here. 
uh, in that um, in the psychedelic state, um, you get reductions in alpha power. So there's less alpha brain waves, right? Um, and, and it does it to other frequency bands too, but alpha seems to be related to almost like in a sense, perhaps like how much our previous memories and thoughts are constraining our current perception or, or experience. It's like mm. how strong are our priors or our expectations is in alpha activity. So it could be a reduction in alpha. Um, actually, in certain parts of your brain, it's associated with ego dissolution and changes in our sense of meaning. Um, so I would think, uh, although it hasn't been studied directly, uh, to my knowledge, that reductions in alpha power might be related to increased um, creativity in some aspect or yeah that's that's what I could say but they, I don't think it's been explicitly looked at and so I mean theta is kind of often thought about as being where the loose associations happen a lot or that's what I've heard is that and then gamma is supposed to be like the aha moments right in, in certain instances, uh, instances it's the binding but it's also aha moments I've heard yeah so. yeah so, so there is a yeah there's a complex interplay between them right theta is often associated with the kind of what you said a loosening uh, of cognitive constraints and more like uh, uh, like almost drifting into dreamlike kind of anything goes type of thing. Um, and mm -hmm. psychedelics do affect theta as well and they do affect gamma. So like, you know, I'm saying mm -hmm. alpha, but like I'm sure they're all reduced or in, like in uh, ways that are interlinked, but slightly different. And collectively mm -hmm. they lead to changes in creativity because the brain is deeply interconnected and it's hard to talk about one thing in isolation, right? So I think all those three brain waves are, are disrupted under psychedelics and relate to creativity in different ways or at different periods or, or something like this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For sure. Get ready for a wave of neurofeedback. The group is starting to get into it. <laughs> yeah. Pretty funny. So we got last person here. I think we're going to cap it here. Uh, Ryan, uh, you are back up. Uh, I saw your hand come back up. You, you have another question? Cool. Go ahead and unmute and you're uh, ready to go. Oh, hi. So, so just another quick question. Um, about um, specifically with psilocybin, ha has there been any studies, um, anyone, anything you've heard about releasing trapped emotions, even from a sort of an abstract uh, in a sense? I'm not necessarily like processing specific areas of your life, but just, yeah, almost in a, like I say, an abstract sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, this definitely happens during psychedelic experiences and, and also within uh, clinical studies, they've had people um, have like, I think you're referring to more like an emotional catharsis where you'll start crying, you're laughing uncontrollably, but it's not linked to anything in particular. You're just releasing this energy in the form of emotion. Yeah, but not like marijuana. It's not like mm -hmm. a, it's sort of a deeper kind of uh, thing. And, and is there any information about how that's related to creativity or Personal growth. Yeah, I would it's, say um, psilocybin specifically. I would say in terms of theories that are on, out there right now, the idea is that uh, psychedelics kind of break down or loosen up our ego defenses. And that's also associated with kind of keeping things constrained to reality and keeping them realistic, right? Because when our ego is fortified, our models, our narratives of how things are, who we are, are strong. And that kind of... Um, hinders creativity, hinders our ability to explore different domains and also can suppress certain memories and emotions, right? And so the idea is that psychedelics kind of uh, make it less rigid and more malleable and open up more space in our psyche for these different ideas to come, but also more emotions to come up. Um, so like a, like a mental massaging, a way of like, whatever. Tension. Yeah. Kind of, uh, yeah, knots or things that could be in there that are, are holding, yeah. Yeah, I, I think definitely, I, I personally think, yeah, for sure, something like that going on where we're just like putting your body uh, and your mind in a state where those knots that are there can start to unravel and that releases energy when it happens. Um, and it does this by putting us in a state where we're very kind of open and sensitive and less bogged down by our understanding of who we are and how things are in this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For sure. All right, that is all the questions. Thank you, everyone, for the awesome questions. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Christoph, any closing words you want to say before we jump into the our, our break? Um, 
Uh, no, not to, just definitely want to just thank everyone for coming out here. And I want to thank um, uh, Manesh for giving this wonderful presentation and having a chance to answer all those questions and everything. And um, also want to thank Ken for doing the moderating. And again, all of you guys for coming out and being part of this. So again, uh, if you want to definitely check out Manesh, uh, the psychedelic scientist on YouTube, you can subscribe to his channel and check out his videos. He's got a lot of great stuff there. Um, also just wanted to say, I know I got a couple of messages from you guys. I'm just on my phone, so I'm really kind of handicapped at answering any of these. So if you guys want to shoot any messages or anything, just send it, um, just message either myself or Ken on uh, the uh, meetup.com app. And um, yeah, we're, we're look, definitely looking forward to having you guys again. It's on the 27th mm -hmm. of June. For our next one, we'll have the event page up in the next couple of days. So anyway, cool. we'll take a quick admission. Well, hang on one second. I, I feel bad. Someone had a little technical issue and was not able to ask a question. So Melly, uh, Minish, actually, if you can see in the chat, someone asked a question. Uh, it's, it's a bit for long sure. for me to read the, from Melly. Melly, if you want to unmute your mic, you can do that as well, or else he's just going to read it out and, and, and get that last one in there. Yeah, I guess answer. Uh, I did. I, I quickly sent Melly a, a direct message here. Uh, but I could say it out loud too. Is she still in the room? I can see her name. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, she is. She still is online. Um, so basically, the question is whether is the idea that um, and, and for people who have schizophrenia, showing that their when their default mode network is more uh, disconnected, it's associated with poor outcomes. That people with schizophrenia who have a less integrated default mode. Um, you know, do badly in their long in their prognos prognosis. They don't recover as as much or as well. Um, and like so, therefore, can psychedelics because they make the brain more interconnected uh, can help uh, people who have schizophrenia. And um, it's an interesting question. And I know people like uh, like I'm good friends with Mark Hayden, and I know he sees that Mark Hayden is director of Maps Canada, and he see some potential use for psychedelics in low doses for potentially helping people with schizophrenia. But it's a very uh, risky territory um, because if you take too much, it can destabilize people, especially with the predisposition. Um, and so I think there could be something there, um, but something important to recognize is that a lot of people with schizophrenia, especially with chronic schizophrenia, as opposed to first onset psychosis, um, the disconnections between brain regions are more structural they're more like in terms of the hardware of the brain whereas psychedelics they work on in the, in the short term on the software of the brain which is how activity runs through these connections and so in order for psychedelics to help create those new connections that are lacking in a person with chronic schizophrenia uh, it would require a lot perhaps microdosing and taking a long a smaller amount over a period of time might be better and combined with some kind of uh, therapeutic intervention and integration strategy. Um, so yeah, it's a really interesting idea that it, it can work uh, over time and uh, I think worth exploring. And I think that idea that it, it can help restore connectivity where there's disconnectivity in schizophrenia is a good idea. Um, so maybe that'll come up in research in the next few years. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know uh, Mark Hayden, uh, <clears throat> what he's referring to there, uh, Mark Hayden has been Kind of calling out to the world looking for folks that have uh, experience with uh, any psychedelics and uh, schizophrenia um, he's very interested in it so if you know anyone uh, find Mark Aiden or find one of us that we can connect to he's looking for people out there to, to talk to um, so yeah again thank you everybody for joining um,